in the next day or two concerning uh, the final exam. The final exam will be online. Um, I figure that makes it more convenient for everyone. Um, it'll be very similar to the way the midterm was. What else do I want to say about that? I will also post information like when the absolute last date to turn in a late assignment would be. Um, we have class today. Um, obviously, the stuff that we're doing today, there's not going to be an assignment for. But you should understand it for um, the exam, because it's fair game um, on the exam to ask questions about it. Obviously, it won't be questions asked like on a technical level, but it will be questions conceptually. Um, the, yeah, there'll be an announcement that we'll just so, sort of talk of all this um, as well. Wednesday uh, will be a work day for you to uh, kind of a last day to catch up on stuff um, and, and, uh, and, you know, during the normal lab period. I don't have regularly scheduled uh, times that I'll be on campus next week. I'll probably be on campus a lot, all right, at least relatively a lot. But um, if you want to see me and if you have questions about stuff, then then contact me via email or through any of the other means, and we can arrange something. So if you need to see me next week, make essentially make an appointment. Um, if there's a certain times I know I will be here, I will post them as an announcement. All right? Okay. Onward and upward. What does it mean when we, what does it mean in information technology or in programming when we talk about persistence? You know, usually like in English you say persistence means, you know, someone sticks to it. You know, they don't give up easy. Well, I guess that's important when it comes to programming. But when we talk about the persistence of data, uh, that means something else. What does it mean when we talk about the persistence of data? Yes? Yeah, exactly. It relates, to, it relates to saving data. It relates to keeping data around for a while as opposed for, um, you know, a short time. For example, none of your assignments, to my knowledge, have any sort of uh, persistence of data in them, right? Um, if you were to um, start up an application and uh, start up the account application, for example, the bank account one, and do all your deposits and withdrawals, if you were to close it and reopen it, it would start again with a fresh slate, all right? So it's not like you're saving the data anywhere. So really, the topic today relates to saving data and a couple of ways that we can save data in, um, in, in Java um, terms, all right? Um, that brings us to a topic of a simple way to store an object is to call serializing the object, all right? Serial, S-E-R-I-A-L. Not breakfast cereal, all right? What does it mean when, when we talk about something being serial? We talk about serializing or something that's serial. What does serial mean? In a row, right. Um, I think in the old days, they used to like call soap operas serials, all right? And I remember my dad talking about like radio serials. You know, or like sometimes before a movie that have like a 10, 15 minute like cowboy serial. And what that was is things that go sequentially, like one after another. You know, soap opera, you have week one, then you have week two, then you have week three, and it, it sort of goes from there. So it's, it's in a line. All right. Uh, that's maybe the opposite of that is like what you do now with Netflix, where they release everything all at the same time, right? So you can binge watch it, you know. Uh, that's sort of like parallel processing, right? Parallel connections where everything comes out at the same time. In fact, you even talk about different kinds of ports on a computer as being either serial or parallel. Parallel means all the bits of a byte would go at once. Serial means that they'd go just one at a time, and they'd go in a sequence where the sequence was important. So essentially, if you think about an object, an object is, can be pretty complex, right? It can have many attributes associated with it. It can have many uh, 
many attributes of different types. I mean, one object can contain another object, and one object contain an array list of objects, like we saw with the pizza order, uh, and so on. So that's anything but a linear straight line sort of organization. It's a sort of a complex structure. What serializing, though, allows us to take it and reduce it, or, or sort of, I think of it like freeze drying it, you know, or dehydrating it. It takes it and it sort of makes a flattened, straight line, serial version of the data, et cetera, that are contained within an object. And then you can store that in a file. Or you can use it to pass objects between, uh, between uh, Java virtual machines. All right? That's something that we didn't get into. All our programs ran on one uh, uh, virtual machine. But there's something called RMI, Remote Method Invocation, where you can actually have uh, um, an application on running on one Java virtual machine call a function on a second virtual machine. All right? These are talking about larger systems. Really, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today really relates to larger systems that may be communicating with other systems uh, and so on. So you might actually have an application that I write communicating with an application that someone else wrote, all right? Uh, and you need to pass data between them, just like you need to pass data within regular methods. Well, one way that you can pass an object is if you serialize it. So serializing is sort of taking this 3D object that can be any sort of complex structure and sort of flattening it down into like a straight line, a stream of data. All right? So I believe I have an example of this. And it's not necessarily a, an elegant example, but it'll do the trick. This is not it. There we go. All right, I have two things in this. I have a person and I have a person GUI. The idea is, is this would be like one way that maybe you would store in an application like information about the person, you know, like, uh, like your account information in Gmail would be an example of a page like this, where it's just information about you that you, that you can store that can be used in other places. So let's look at this. Let's first of all compile it and run it so we get a sense of what it does. And then we'll look uh, in more detail at the code. my morning class. I must have pasted it in there.
going to run my person GUI. And I just have some parameters about a person. This is very uh, um, straightforward, very simplistic. So I can enter in my name, my email, and then my phone, uh, phone number. And I can click Save. All right? So I click Save. I close out of here, and let's look. There is a new kind of file in here, right? In addition to the Java source files and the compiled class files, there's an SER file. And SER is just the extension that I used. I could have really used anything, but it stands for serial or serialized. This is really a machine readable file. If we look at it, though, we can sort of pick out pieces of information. So I'm going to open this up in Notepad++. And like we can see, like some of the stuff we can read. And some of the stuff really doesn't make sense. Like, that tells me the name of the class it is, right? Person. This is the person class that I serialized. Email is one of the fields in it. And it's a, it's a string. Name is one of the fields in it. Phone is one of the fields in it. And that's the values for those data. Zellers, Mike, 4796. So it's not really human readable, all right? But we can kind of pluck some things out. Essentially, this is, this is a serialized version of that three-dimensional, if you will, object. All right, because remember, an object can have all kinds of complex things in it. This is just that object and boiled down, dehydrated, freeze-dried into a flat file. A flat file means simply a file that is read from beginning to end as, as a string of characters. Okay. So now, what does that mean? It means it's saved out there, which means I can bring it in. So if I run this again, I have a button that says Retrieve. Now, I could have had this happen automatically, right? Um, the way that this is written currently, uh, I have the buttons there to make it more dramatic, all right? To, to make it so I can clearly show you that if I click Retrieve, boom the data comes back from where it was saved before. Um, if I was doing this for real, I'd probably have a save button, uh, and I, I would um, um, automatically, when the window opens, bring up uh, retrieve the data. I wouldn't, ha I wouldn't require the user to press the retrieve button to, to, to save it. All right? So the bottom line is this is the first time I've saved data in an application, and we've done it through serialization. So how do you serialize something? Well, first of all, let's look at the code. Let's look at the GUI code. This should largely be review, because we're not serializing the GUI. I have all my stuff in here. I have person GUI. I define my labels and my panels and all that stuff. I create my panels. I define listeners for the save, clear, and retrieve. Now, I lied a little bit. There is something. This is not serialized, so I didn't lie about that part. But it does handle the serialization uh, of the person object. Because if you notice, the save is going to take and it's going to output the data into a file named person.ser. And the retrieve is going to read that file. The clear simply clears out the interface. I normally do not use clear buttons on any of my forms. I don't think they're a good idea, because usually people accidentally 
hit them, right? And uh, that can cause trouble. So let's look at the code here to save it. Again, notice how I did this. This is the way I like to do it. It may be straightforward, uh, and it, it, th there's ways to write your code in a more terse manner. But I don't think terse code is your only goal, right? Especially in an educational environment, writing code that's easy for people to understand is important. And in a professional programming environment, that's important as well. As well. So I have three buttons. For each of those buttons, I have defined an action listener. And I've defined inside of this class, inside of my GUI class, these three action listeners. Save, clear, and retrieve. All right? It's OK to do this, remember, because I don't expect my save button to work on any other page. So I don't care the fact that that class is not reusable. That is defined as an inner class inside my GUI. That's perfectly acceptable in my mind. Likewise with clear and retrieve. I have them defined here. They, of course, implement action listener. What does it mean to implement a listener? It means you have to have all of the functions implemented that the interface has associated with it. Well, there's only one function in the action listener, and that is action performed. And with the button, the action that it's listening for is the click the click action. So what do I do when someone clicks on that? I create a new person object and I initialize that person object by using the constructor and I give it the name, the email, and the phone number from the different text boxes. Remember we defined up there the text boxes. All right. Now I'm just saying okay Let's make a new person object and let's call the constructor and let's give, uh, let's give the uh, uh, person object a, uh, you know, the three parameters, the name, the email, and all that. I then create a file output stream and an object output stream. Think of it this way. A little diagram might be useful here. We have within our Java machine, we have an object that's just resting out on the heap. We have our disk, our computer disk. The file output stream takes a stream of data and writes it to a file somewhere on disk. All right? That's what the file output stream does. It's a way to get a file on a disk. What kind of file? Any file. Doesn't matter. As long as we can give a stream of data. Again, what's the stream of data? Well, it's where you have the first byte, the second byte, the third byte. You know, a stream of data, just like a stream of water. It flows from one place to another. In this case, though, we don't want to output just any data. We want to output an object data. So we have to have this little adapter, in a way, that takes an object, like the person object, and outputs an output stream that this file output can take and actually create the file. So, you know, think of this like, like chain and cables together. How do you get there from here? Well, this file output stream creates files on disk. But it needs the input of an input stream. All right? It needs to get its input from another output stream. And in this case, this object output stream is what takes the object and essentially uh, serializes it so that it can be written out to a file. So these two instructions together create the mechanism um, for uh, outputting a serialized file. 
I now have this stuff in a try-catch. All right? Why do I have it in a try-catch? Well, remember, anything risky you have in a try-catch. All right? Why is outputting a file a risky operation? What's well, something that could go wrong? Yes? Yeah, maybe somehow the disk is damaged, or like the fat table and the disk is damaged, so it's trying to create a file and it can't really do it. All right, at least not maybe in the in the directory you want to. Will be another one, another possibility. Yeah, if you're out of space, if you're trying to write data to a, a disk that's out of space, that could go wrong. Remember, risky. Uh, another way to say risky is that when it's something that's out of the control of the program. All right. In this case, you know, there's nothing we can do to write in our Java program that can make sure that there's enough space on the disk, right? Um, is either there or not, or that we're going to run into some sort of weird problem when we try to create an output file. So therefore, that's considered risky. So our program can't like control that. That's out of this program's control. So we put it in a try. We try to create the file output. We attach our object output stream to the file output stream, all right, that's hooking the, the cables together with the adapters, then finally we tell the object output stream to write the object P, which is the person object that we created here. All right, so we have these streams, we create our file, we create our mechanism to give the file output object the data we need to give it, which is currently in an object, and then we write that object to the output object, and then that gets piped out to the file output stream and gets piped out to that file. So that's how we got person.ser. Again, ser, I could call that extension anything I wanted to, right? But ser seems like a reasonable name for an extension, all right? It's not a text file, it's not txt. I can't open it up in, in Notepad or whatever, as we saw because it's not human readable, it's machine readable. Now, one thing I would say, one thing I would do differently if I was writing this today would be this. I'd definitely put this guy inside here. Why do, why do, and, and I, you know, I might just put all these guys inside there, but I definitely would put this guy in here. Why would I put that creation of the person object in there? Because that takes data from the user, right? And that's a risky operation, all right? Since this is a, a simplistic, straightforward application, I'm not throwing exceptions in the person class. But I sure as heck should be, right? I should be looking to make sure that, the, that something was entered for the name, and whatever my application required, at least something for the name, probably something for the email, and probably something for the, um, for the um, um, phone number as well. But yeah, there should be some exception handling in it, and currently there isn't. So that's what happens when we save it. We create an object, we grab all the values from the text box, text boxes, we create the object and give those values in the constructor to initialize it. We then create our pipeline to the disk, we create a pipeline from the object, and then we say, hey, go and write that object out, and that will go through these like little adapters and end up outputting it to disk. If there's any sort of error that we display a file stack trace. Here's a, here's a dumb question. How could I for, if I wanted to test the errors here, I want to test the error trapping, how could I possibly do that? How could I test that this catch works right? 
I'd have to go and make it so that it can't create that file. Well, what could I do? I could fill up my disk. I could take a magnet and put it to. Yeah, I could make it read only. That would be a good way to do it. The other thing I could do is I could put like illegal characters in the file name. So let's try that. I'm pretty sure an asterisk is not a, a legal character, right? Some of these aren't legal. So I'll try to write to that file. Interestingly enough, it did not. File name directory is syntax is incorrect. Oh, why did it do that? Because I'm dumb, that's why. I don't think I, or did I save this? I did save this. I caught an exception. File not found exception. I don't know why that happened, but if we had more time, I'd figure it out. All right. That's the bottom line, though. Sometime, and again, that was something that was tricky in one of the previous jobs I had, right? Is we had to test for all these outlandish error, condition, uh, er error conditions that, um, you know, how can you recreate them? Well, you figure out ways to recreate them if you want to thoroughly test your application on what it's going to do. All right, let's go and resave this, recompile it. Whoops. Clear it out, retrieve, there it clears it out. So what's the retrieve do? You can almost guess what the retrieve looks like, right? It's going to have the same sort of files, but moving in the opposite direction. As a file input stream, guess what that does? It's able to read a file and send it somewhere. And that somewhere is this object input stream that takes that information and go and can make an object out of it. Now, in this case, we create these two objects. I open up the file that I saved it to. All right. I define my, I, I connect those two adapters together, just like I did with the output. I mean, it's the same thing, just sort of moving in the other direction. And then I say my person, object P, equals the object read object. So I read the object input stream, since it's connected to a file input stream, it pulls it from that file. And I now have my person object P. I then fill up those pieces of data uh, in the form, in the GUI, the text name, text box, the text email, and the text phone. I fill those in, I do the set text on them, by grabbing the name from the person object, grabbing the email from the email object, and so on. 
And likewise, I have a stack trace if there's an exception. Question, why do I have this? Why do I say person O in read object? I'm casting it. What does casting mean? It means I'm telling the compiler to treat this object in a certain way. I'm telling it to treat it like a person. All right? Well, that sounds weird. Treat it like a person. All right? Treat it like a person object. All right? Why do I need to do that? Well, I need to do that because I need to create a person object. Right? The reason I have to do this is this read object method simply reads in, is the method I'm going to use for any kind of object that I save. Right? So this could be a pizza object. It could be an order object. It could be a student object, a course object. Think of any object we created throughout this course. We could have saved it using this method. In which case, when we read it back in, we don't know what we're getting. Right? Or rather, the compiler doesn't know what it's getting. It's getting any kind of object that exists. We have to tell it because we have inside information. We know that that person.ser file contains data saved from a person object. So therefore, we help the compiler along a little bit to say, oh yeah, by the way, I know that that is a person object. All right. So therefore, treat it like a person object. And then we can call the different sets and gets, or in this case, the sets to set the values in that pizza object. Uh, or rather, get the values in the pizza object and set the values of the text box. So we're using the get from the object, the set from the GUI. If I put something else in here, pizza, for example, what would happen? Well, what would happen if you tried to treat a pizza like a person? Pardon me? Yeah, an error's going to occur, an illegal cast operation or something like that, exception. Because you can't take an object of one kind and treat it like another, unless they were a subclass. All right? For example, if I had a subclass of person to be like retired person, then I could take a retired person object and treat it just like a person object. I couldn't go the other way around. If I saved a person object, I couldn't cast it as a retired person object because not all people are retired people, but all retired people are people. All right? So it's really, it's really commonsensical. You can't treat an object that you save as another object unless it's in the inheritance hierarchy. How could I get this where I could maybe save more than one name? Maybe I could save, like, maybe I could make a little contact list where I could save the name of a person and um, other information about them. Right now, this only saves one person's information at a time. Could make an array list of people. I guess the other thing I would add to that is I could make an array list of people and then save the array list uh, out to disk. I could have a contact list which contained an error list. The other thing I could do is I could change the name of the file. Maybe the file would be their email address .ser. So people don't have duplicated email addresses, so that would be a good thing to use as like to identify it. So I could have one file out there, each with a different name. All right, that would be another possibility. So. We can save the data by going through this stream going out from the application to the file. We can bring it in by using a stream going in. Now, we can't do that with just any old object. The object has to be defined as serializable. All right? How do you define an object as serializable? First of all, what do you think serializable is going to be? Do you think it's going to be a class or an interface? An interface. Why do you say interface? Yeah, in other words, here's sort of the idea that um, remember you use inheritance when something really is something. 
you know, when there really is a relationship between the two classes, like student and grad student. Maybe there's an inheritance relationship. Serializable isn't really a that sort of relationship, right? It's, it's not really that kind of is a relationship. It's more of a behavior that we want a bunch of different objects to exhibit. We might want a bunch of different objects in our application, regardless of where they are in the inheritance chart, to act as though they are serializable. So it's a certain behavior we want them to exhibit. And here's the good news. All we do is we say it implements serializable. There are no methods, all right, there are no methods that you have to implement. You just define it as serializable, all right? And there's not even any methods that you have to inherit. Uh, or, I'm sorry, not inherit, implement. So it's super easy to use that, all right? And then you could use this any place where a serializable object is required. Where are serializable objects required? I would say they're required here. When you read in an object and sort of make the object from the freeze-dried version of the object. And they're required here, where you output, or rather here, rather where you output that object. So to make it serializable doesn't mean you have to implement any methods, but to make it serializable means you can use it here, and you can use it in this sort of statement. All right? Because those statements use serializable objects. Are there any kinds of objects that can't be serialized? Yes. What are the conditions by which they can't be serialized? I don't remember. So I'll Google it. What Java objects cannot be serialized? Which variable cannot be serialized? Um, what can and can't be serialized? Blah, 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 blah. They're talking about when you, what does it make sense? One thing, I do not believe static variables are serialized. I don't see an easy answer here. Uh, but there are rules. All right, there's rules. In some cases, things can't be serialized. Um, OK, what um, else about this was I going to say? That's about it. I mean, it's straight, really straightforward. Now, obviously, you're not going to store volumes of data like this. Right? This would be something like, like maybe a control file. You, know, you, would, you would set up this way where you'd set up and create a serialized version of the object for control data or something like that. 
Oh, versions. One issue could be if you go and make changes to it um, and you serialize an old version, you might have difficulty when you try to deserialize an old version uh, of the object if you have a newer version of the object. Okay. Um, anyhow, we're not going to store tons of data with this. Um, we are. Uh, the other ways that you can store data within Java, where you can store objects, are in relational databases, and there's something called object-oriented databases. I have to say I'm not terribly familiar with object-oriented databases. I've never worked with them, but you'd be able to save an object in a database and save the whole object in a database. Much more common, I think, and what I'm much more familiar with is relational databases. Now, with relational databases, there is um, a framework called JDBC. That stands for Java Database Connectivity. What you can think of that is, is almost like that output stream. The JDBC classes control output and input from the database. So if I have a class that wants to write to the database, I don't directly access the database. I make calls to the JDBC cl classes, and they manage the database for me. All right? Um, sometimes within a class, you have to map it to a database table or series of tables. Let's think, for example, of this class, the person class. If we were going to store the person class in a relational database, that's pretty straightforward. We'd have a table with these things associated with it. We'd have a string field for name, a string field for email, and a string field for phone. Maybe you would have some sort of ID number, too, that would identify the person. So this would really correspond to, like, one table. If you think of more complicated objects, though, you're going to get something that corresponds to more than a table. For example, our pizza order table. Our pe yeah, our order table for pizzas. For each order, there's some header information about the order, when it was placed, was it pickup or delivery, the name of the person that placed it, the address, and so on. But there's also a list of orders associated with that that would need to be there. So in this case, the person might map to just a person table in the database, whereas our pizza order might map actually to a couple different tables. The pizza and the order table. All right. So, in other words, to save a person in the table might constitute a single insert into the person table. To save a pizza order, it might first update the order table, then update pizza one, pizza two, pizza three, pizza four, or rather insert those pizzas until all the pizzas were there. So one action of saving a pizza order might constitute several actions of saving in the database. When you have something like that, there, that is called a transaction. All right. The idea is that a transaction is a group of things that shouldn't be split up. It either succeeds completely or fails completely. All right. So if I were going to update a pizza order, if I only update the header and I can't update the pizza for whatever reason, I don't want that order to be inserted into the, into the database. All right? I want to get an error saying I couldn't insert this order. Because I don't want to half insert an order. All right? I either want to do it or not. So it will try to update the order and all the pizzas. If it can't do all of them, then none of them will succeed. None of the database operations will succeed. That's what I mean by a transaction. Now, in larger applications, there are things called enterprise Java beans, which sort of do a lot of this handling for us. 
does the transactioning, it handles a lot of this sort of thing associated with us. Again, uh, as I mentioned, that's one of the things that if you were to look at larger applications um, that could run on an application server uh, where multiple people are accessing data at the same time, et cetera. Larger enterprise application. EJBs might, be, might come into play to handle that sort of database functionality for you. All right. Are there any questions? over serialization and other forms of persistent data. All right, that's all I had today. Look for an announcement uh, about the uh, final um, sometime this week within the next couple days. Uh, pay attention to the due dates and the final due date. Remember, Wednesday is a work-only class, so we'll just go right to lab. And also remember, if you need to see me next week, to make an appointment. All right, we'll see you up in lab.